The United States purchased the territory of Louisiana from the First French Republic in 1803. This single acquisition of land doubled the young nation's territorial mass overnight. The following five decades would see even more land ceded to the United States through the Treaty of Oregon with Great Britain and the annexation of Texas in 1846, followed by a war and subsequent treaties with Mexico, which led to more territorial gains by 1853. This expansion would fulfill the supposed God-given destiny to build a nation from the Atlantic to the Pacific coasts, at least on paper. The newly acquired lands were still home to thousands of indigenous tribes resistant to the newcomers. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase had tasked the American government with the precarious task of pacifying the southwestern reaches of their nation. Plagued with century-old rivalries between different Native American tribes and Hispano frontiersmen. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 forced thousands of Native Americans from the five civilized tribes, those being the Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw to Indian Territory, modern-day Oklahoma, on the very edge of the Great Plains, a region home to bands of indigenous people with a proud warrior tradition with rivalries just as fierce as those in the Southwest and a hostility towards intruders. To add to the complication of westward expansion, were thousands of Anglo-American settlers moving to the newly acquired frontier, bringing with them not only their livelihoods, but also their ideologies. The Civil War merely delayed the expansion of Anglo-Americans westward and prolonged the death and destruction of Native American societies west of the Mississippi River. The question of slavery would bleed into these new lands as violently as they would in the East, the only difference being that the American Civil War would merely be a continuation of the conflict that had been going on for generations before the arrival of the Americans. The election of Andrew Jackson saw the signing of the Indian Removal Act in 1830, which proposed the deportation of the five civilized tribes from their original lands in the American Southeast to modern-day Oklahoma. Tribal members opposed the forced removal, especially members of the Cherokee and Creek tribes. However, the opposition was not uniform throughout these nations and many, primarily those of mixed native and white heritage, believe that moving would be in the best interest of the tribe, causing violent outbursts between the now divided tribal members. Anti-removal Creeks assassinated a prominent Creek chief named William McIntosh, along with other chiefs after they were found guilty by the Creek Council of violating Creek law by signing removal treaties and subsequently ordered their execution. The Cherokee also saw their nation divided some Cherokee moved to the Indian Territory before Jackson signed the Removal Act into law. These people were known as the Old Settlers. Some groups of Cherokee continued to resist, but were eventually removed in an event now referred to as the Trail of Tears. The newcomers in Indian Territory did not want to live under the rules established by the Old Settlers, which caused violence and chaos until President James Polk came down and threatened the Cherokee with permanent division. The Cherokee people then sat down and held a council where the Cherokee Treaty of 1846 was signed, and peace would prevail, albeit uneasily. The Chickasaw and Choctaw signed treaties and moved to Indian Territory less dramatically than the Cherokee and Creek, but the Seminole collectively fought against the United States until 1842. Although there was relative peace in the Indian nations after 1846, there is still social and cultural divide between the conservative, full-blooded Cherokee and Creek members who lived traditionally, spoke their native language and little English, and those who were of mixed heritage, who tended to be wealthier, owned slaves, spoke more English than their people's language. By the time the Civil War began, it only reignited the previous strife between the two societies. The geographical proximity of Indian territory to the South, as well as sympathy towards the Southern cause by the wealthier, slave-owning natives of mixed heritage meant that the Confederacy had a significant foothold in the region. In fact, Union forces had already retreated out of Indian Territory into Kansas in the wake of the conflict. Of course, the tribes did not unanimously side with the Confederacy. The traditional Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole preferred to honor their treaties with the United States rather than make new ones with this rebel nation. Shawnee, Delaware, Seneca and other smaller tribes and members of the Plains tribe sided with the Union and Confederacy individually, depending on their beliefs. The non-traditional Creek, Cherokee, as well as the Chickasaw and Choctaw sided with the Confederacy and were armed and formed into regiments before the Union, who reluctantly created Indian regiments. The reason why the Union was hesitant to arm loyal Indians was because they distrusted them. 
The Union was currently at war with the Blackfoot and the Sioux on the northern Great Plains at the beginning of the Civil War, and for the 50 years leading up to the war, Comanche and Kiowa war parties tormented settlers through raids on the southern Great Plains. The Americans, like the Spanish and other Europeans before them, had difficulty understanding the social dynamic of Native Americans, especially in the West and on the Great Plains. There were never unified tribes of Comanche, Apache, Sioux, or any other nomadic or semi-nomadic tribes west of the Mississippi. They were people brought together by similar language and cultures, but were organized into distinct bands or clans. The bands may have had a chief, but that chief had no sway over other bands of the same tribe. In fact, a chief had very little control over individual warriors who enjoyed a great deal of autonomy. However, at this point, Anglo-American culture significantly influenced the removed tribes and in Indian territory, who adopted a more centralized form of government. Because of this influence, the traditional members of the five civilized tribes showcased an immense loyalty to their people and then to the United States during the war. The onset of the Civil War meant that Union forces in Texas would have to leave their frontier posts, essentially permitting the frontiersmen on the edge of the Great Plains to be unprotected from war parties of marauding Comanches and Kiowas. The depredations, as often described in newspapers at the time, left the settlers enraged, inciting them to go on raids of their own, causing a never-ending struggle for revenge that mirrored the situation in the New Mexico Territory. American arrival in New Mexico also saw further complications of century-long feuds between Apache, Navajo, Pueblo, Ute, and Hispano people. The Southwest had been undergoing an ethnic war that saw a constant raiding, which led to the theft of thousands of animals and kidnapping of people. The way of war on the Great Plains and the deserts of the Southwest were similar in that aspect. Men of rival tribes were slaughtered, and women and children were enslaved. This included not only Native American tribes, but also Mexicans and the newly arrived Americans. The U.S. Army did not always provide adequate protection. This massive withdrawal from the frontier to focus on subduing a rebellion in the East and the newly formed Confederate Army now too focused on achieving independence. The settlements on the edge of the American civilization were now vulnerable to attack. American civilians north of Indian Territory had more to worry about than just raids from the already demonized free Native American tribes. They also had to worry about fellow white men. Many fighting aged men opted to join bands of guerrillas known as Jayhawkers on the Union side and Bushwhackers on the Confederate side. This type of warfare disproportionately affected the Trans-Mississippi Theater compared to the guerrilla warfare in the East. Although they claimed to fight for the cause of their respective nations, they often resorted to escapades that were simply criminal. Ironically, white settlers were quick to demonize free Native American tribes for their, quote, cowardly way of fighting, attacking targets of opportunity like outnumbered ranchers and farmers or undefended women and children left by their husbands and fathers to fight a war. However, these Jayhawkers and Bushwhackers would conduct similar raids. They ambushed men and fighting age boys working in their fields or on the road, stealing cattle, horses, and other livestock burning down homesteads and crop fields. These attacks would generally be directed at those considered to be sympathetic to the opposing side or against small patrols of soldiers. On top of theft and arson from guerrillas, many civilians in Missouri, Kansas, and New Mexico also suffered from supply shortages. Confederate blockades often disrupted the ability of trains from the east to supply Union settlements in New Mexico. Difficult terrain and weather accompanied by raids from nomadic tribes and guerrillas throughout the frontier states and territories often led to mass shortages for both civilians and soldiers. Native American soldiers fighting for the Union in Indian Territory were not permitted to care for their livestock while in service to the Army. Their absence led to theft of hundreds of cattle, exasperating the economic hardships of Native American families in the region and led to a desertion epidemic among the Indian regiments. Soldiers who remained in the army began to forage for supplies, which meant further theft from civilian livestock and produce, creating a refugee crisis in Indian territory in the Ozarks and creating an anti-Confederate settlement in New Mexico. Guerrilla warfare was commonplace in Indian territory, 
Native Americans often accompanied Jayhawkers and Bushwhackers from tribes living in and around Indian Territory. First Lieutenant Joseph Trago of the 5th Kansas Cavalry spoke about defending Fort Lincoln from, quote, the bands mixed up of border ruffians and half-breed Cherokees that threaten it, and have twice entered Kansas on the southern boundary killing men at their homes and destroying everything they could, end quote. This type of warfare was seen as a cowardly mode of warfare, but to Native Americans, guerrilla warfare tactics were what they considered honorable. Ameri Indians did not, not conduct warfare in the Eurocentric fashion that Americans did. Native Americans saw it as a waste of life to stand and fight over a piece of land while sustaining heavy casualties. They saw it more beneficial to live to fight another day. In contrast, white Americans saw this mindset as spineless. As Private John Gray, a member of the 1st Independent Battery Kansas Light Artillery said, There's quite a number of Indians deserted the rebels and joined us in the past month. Beside a great number that have went home, they are mostly Cherokees, Creeks, and Choctaws, and they are not much account to either party. They will not fight unless compelled to, and then break the line at the first volley. Such soldiers we have very little use for, especially when there is anything to be done. They will do very well as scouts and skirmishers, and there they are not as good as whites." End quote. Commanding officers, however, saw their usefulness as scouts, and often deployed them in such roles. The main concern of white officers on both sides of the war when using Native American troops was the tactics used. One thing that was commonplace amongst most tribes in North America was the tendency to kill captives and mutilate the dead, a practice seen as barbaric to their white counterparts, but seen as ordinary occurrence for Native Americans. Officers on both sides agreed to forbid such activities within their regiments. For the five civilized tribes, the American Civil War was simply a spark that reignited old grievances. Apotliahola was a prominent chief of the Creek Nation. At the outbreak of the war, Chief Apotliahola and the full-blooded members of his tribe, as well as members of other tribes, freedmen, and refugee slaves, decided to remain loyal to the federal government, citing the southern states' governments as their reason for their removal from their ancestral lands. However, the slave-holding and mixed-heritage natives living in Indian Territory overwhelmingly supported the Confederacy and began to drive the Loyalist Indians from modern-day Oklahoma. While the Loyalists secured some level of victory at the Battle of Red Mountain, they were ultimately forced to Kansas as refugees, suffering around 2,000 deaths from an initial 9,000 followers. Initially, the Confederacy was the only side to employ the use of Native American troops beginning in 1861. However, the Confederate government confined Native American troops' operations to within Indian Territory. They served under command of primarily white field grade officers, with some exceptions, like Colonel Stan Waddy, who commanded the first mounted Cherokee rifles, and would later be the only Native American man promoted to the rank of Brigadier General and the last Confederate general to surrender to the Union. The Confederacy formed organized regiments by tribe. There were specific Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, and Osage brigades. Members of smaller tribes would also act as scouts. The Union would adopt Indian Home Guard regiments in 1862. The organization of regiments were not constrained by tribal affiliation. However, the first Indian Home Guards consisted of Creeks and Seminoles. The second Indian Home Guards would contain members of the Delaware, Kickapoo, Quapaw, Seneca, Shawnee, Osage, and Cherokee. The third Indian Home Guards consisted of soldiers who had previously fought in the Confederate Indian Brigades but had defected, such as Chickasaw and Choctaw tribal members. There was to be a fourth Indian Home Guard, but it was not created before the end of the war. The choice for Native American men to join either side was not nearly as simple as the ability to own slaves or not. The Natives made their choices based on their way of life. Historically, Native American tribes have not been one cohesive nation, but a collection of smaller bands with a similar language and culture. This disunification is another reason why tribes found themselves splitting apart with the outbreak of the war. One tribe or band that had disagreements with another would immediately side with whoever was fighting their long-hated foe. This was not just the case in Indian Territory, but also on the western frontier as the Ute tribe in Arizona and New Mexico sided with the Union to act as scouts. The Utes continued to aid the Union well after the Confederates were pushed out of the region to fight their ancient enemies.
In 1864, Union forces, along with Ute warriors under the command of Colonel Christopher Kit Carson, waged war on the Comanche, Kiowa, and Apache in the Southwest. Europeans and Anglo-Americans never understood this decentralized way of society, just as Native Americans, especially indigenous tribes west of the Mississippi River, never understood the centralized governments of European empires and the United States. For this reason, Comanches and Kiowas continued to raid Texas after making peace treaties with the United States. Additionally, it was for this reason that towns along the frontier in the United States and Mexico were continuously raided by Comanche, Apache, Kiowa, Sioux, and other tribes during the 1860s, despite the treaties made with the military or the government inside specific towns. For a people whose nomadic and semi-nomadic lifestyle inhibited their ability to become one cohesive nation, it was completely foreign to them to see a fully agrarian people who answered to a government thousand miles away. In that same sense, it was equally unfathomable for European-type societies to understand the autonomy tribal members had. While these traits had been physically, spiritually, and mentally beaten out of eastern tribes forcibly removed to the western edge of the United States, remnants of their old society persisted during the Civil War, underlying why they the choice of allegiance was not simple as, do we want to keep our slaves or not? To the wealthy, of mixed heritage, perhaps? However, many Native American soldiers on both sides wanted independence to protect their family and community or to avenge past grievances. The greatest tragedy in the Trans-Mississippi Theater was the colossal number of refugees that the war produced. Bushwhackers and jaywalkers ravaged not only their fellow whites, but also citizens of the Indian nations. Guerrilla fighters burned homes, fields, destroyed property, stole livestock, and operated in ways that whites often demonized natives for doing. Many tribesmen in Indian territory were at this point reliant on the federal government for supplies, and the destruction caused by the war and raids from guerrillas immensely disrupted trade routes and production, creating a refugee crisis which in 1862 affected 3,000 Native Americans. However, the crisis impacted 15,000 people from all the nations within Indian Territory at the war's conclusion. The termination of the war was not the end of the plight of the Native Americans. Reconstruction saw the increased federal control over the five nations in Indian Territory, allowing more and more white settlers to arrive and claim land, while simultaneously creating a dual tribal and federal government, creating two separate societies living amongst each other, but restricting the independence of the Native American communities in the region. Reconstruction also sought to bring back the unity of Americans through westward expansion at the expense of the autonomous groups of natives living west of the Mississippi. The Civil War may have ended slavery, but did not end prejudice against non-white people living in the country. And the post-war era saw the common goal of eradicating the free tribes on the Great Plains and beyond. One woman living on the frontier wrote to her husband, a captain in the 10th Minnesota Volunteers, in May of 1865, Quote, will the Indians ever be annihilated, in reference to raids that the Sioux had conducted? But this statement highlights the ideal outcome for settlers living on the frontier. And within 30 years of the conclusion of the Civil War, the Sioux, Comanche, Apache, Navajo, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Blackfoot, Ute, and hundreds of more tribes containing thousands of people would be confined to reservations on pieces of land a fraction of their former size. The Civil War merely delayed the inevitable, as American westward expansion was a generational dream, but with that delay came more hardships and violence, completely uprooting the way of life for a race of people who had lived there for thousands of years before the first Europeans arrived to the mainland nearly 400 years earlier. Hello everyone, thanks for watching my first ever YouTube video. If you liked the video and you like to learn about Native American history, I'll be creating more videos about the indigenous people of North and South America here shortly. So, again, thank you for watching my video and have a great day.